Okay, so thanks again for that. Um, this direction. Yeah, this, uh, we were in this bullet here. Um, there are many, many uh, questions about the future. Too many questions, good questions. Maybe I will say even some questions that I heard just yesterday when I was uh, at a group meeting in Paris on this. And very few hints, but the questions are interesting. The point is that nobody really knows uh, what's, go what, what, what's in the future for us, and that's what makes it a very interesting time today. So now we go back to the basics and uh, start switching gears a little bit. So um, uh, we're speaking computation. In a classical set of computation, we have like n bits, right? And um, uh, those n bits are a series of n numbers fully describe the system. If I know a series of n uh, binary numbers, I, I cannot have any additional information on the system computationally wise. Um, and uh, in order to do computation, I need to manipulate the state. And I manipulate the state by some uh, physical phenomena, which is not interesting from a computational point of view. So if this was a one bit, I can manipulate it to be a zero bit. And I also can manipulate three bits uh, together. And so if the leftmost bits are zero and one, and I apply a manipulation which I call an end gate, then the rightmost bit became zero. So the same thing is in quantum computing, right? We have n bits, but the state is not fully described by those n bits. It's not enough information. To fully describe the state, I need to uh, introduce this vector in a Hilbert space, in a 2 to the n dimensional Hilbert space, where each axis I denote it by just uh, one uh, classical state of the bits. Um, and this vector fully describes the system, and I can write it just in the algebraic form. And of course, as we know, the interpretation is that the uh, uh, absolute value squared of uh, the amplitude of the coefficient here is just uh, um, my probability to be in any classical state. And uh, manipulation is also done here in order to have computation. So far I described the state, I described the playground, but now I need to do manipulation in order to do computation. So manipulation is just applying some unitary matrix over this vector. So I started with V, apply some matrix U, and arrive at another vector W, and U is the name of the game here, right? OK, so go ahead, like I said, from physics to computer science in three simple slides. So if I have a single bit, I have now a two-dimensional Hilbert space. I can write it in this form, or in this form, or even in this form, all represent the same thing. And I can apply some unitary matrix over this uh, vector. And if I apply this matrix, for example, on this base vector, what I get is um, a, a uniform combination of, um, the two, um, of the two base vectors. OK, so I did this manipulation, which, by the way, is an important man manipulation. This is the Hadamard gate. So I get some linear combination. And if I do the same manipulation over the second, um, over the second base uh, axis, then I also get a uniform linear combination, right? But with an extremely important difference with a minus. And this is extremely important. And this is actually this minus here is all the basis of quantum computation. Without it, we would not have anything more powerful than classical computation. Why am I saying this? Because there are a lot of, um, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, probabilistic algorithms in classical, and people can know, can, can classify them and can theorize about them. But all probabilities are always positive, and the probabilities um, are determined by being additive and so on and so forth. And in some sense, those are probabilities. But as we all know, they are related to probabilities, but they are amplitudes. And because they can be minus, and because we can add amplitudes and not probabilities, this is where the power of quantum computation comes from. 
It's not that the space is exponential, like people sometimes say. It is related, but it's not that. This is the point that if we do it wisely, we can combine amplitude so we will have destructive interference on all the things that we don't want to see. So we want some algorithm which will show me what I want to see. So we combine the amplitude to have destructive interference on everything that I don't want to see. And then by definition, I must have constructive interference on what I want to see. So this is the power of quantum computation. And a little bit terminology. So this unitary matrix, we call it a quantum gate. This superposition, we call it superposition. So this same word in physics is the same as in computer science. Uh, the quantum gates must be legal. Unfortunately, I cannot have here any matrix. If I could, I would have much more powerful computation solving even hard problems. Um, but currently, this must be legal. For example, it must be reversible. This is what physics tell me. And that's it. Okay, switching gears even further. Sometimes we have two-bit gates. By the way, if we wouldn't have any two-bit gates, we would not have universal quantum computing. We could not do anything that a Turing machine can do. So we must have at least um, one two-qubit gate. And then we have a four by four unitary matrix and so on and so on. And we add another name. Now we also have entanglement, okay? So this is setting the stage. Now we are in computer science, okay? What is a quantum algorithm? A quantum algorithm typically starts with a specified set of, initial, of the initial vector over our, our two to the power n Hilbert space. And then we apply any sequence of legal gates just as in classical computing, but the gates are, of course, the gates in the sense that we've seen earlier. And we have a goal. We have a goal if we want the algorithm to be powerful, to do what we, what we want it to do. We want to enhance the desirable amplitude of AI, of the thing that we want to observe, by canceling out all other amplitudes. So we want to apply destructive interference in order to reach constructive interference on the results that we want to see. And this is quite ingenuitive. Designing this algorithm is something that sometimes you see it and you say, wow, how did they? And then the next step is observe the end result. Now with finite probability, finite means it does not go to zero when n, the input goes large, goes to infinity. With, if we designed it correctly, with finite probability, not zero, we will see the desirable state. And this is good, because if we can check if we are at the desirable state, if we are there, fine. If we are not there, just repeat it. Since this is not going to zero, then in a finite number of iterations with probability one, we will reach our result. Okay. Uh, one example, how this works. So we have a problem. We have an oracle. This is the Grover's algorithm, so this is the problem that it solves. We have an oracle. We don't know what is its function, but we know that it is zero everywhere, and it is one for only one particular x, x equals w, and the domain of x is large. It's between one and two to the small n, okay? And we want to find w. That's our goal to find W. So if we only had classical machinery, not much to do. I mean, if you guys have luck, maybe your first guess would be W. You would check. F of X gives one. You found it. If I don't have luck, maybe my last guess would be the W. There is no way to f solve this classically in less than N, large N minus one steps. And this is highly important question because it is immediately related to such formula and what things are hard or not because uh, my oracle can just be a SAT formula, SAT formula over small n variables and of course I can ask for all large n assignments whether it is one or zero and, and if I could do this in less than exponential time then I have p equals np, right? So currently this particular Algorithm, classically, the best algorithm would do it in n times. And lo and behold, we see, we'll now see the algorithm which will do it in square root of n times, and this is still not solving p 
equals n piece. We are still not solving a hard problem in the sense that we heard this morning, but we had a, well, first we have a huge success theoretically. We solve something which is unsolvable in n, we solve it in square root of n, and we have a huge success commercially because if n is, say, one million database, very small database, only one million entries, we have to search instead of one million steps, only 1,000 steps. Huge difference, okay? So this is the algorithm, very simple. We initialize to the uniform distribution, and then we repeat very two simple steps. Iterate square root of n times. This is where the square root of n comes. First, for whatever AI, for whatever amplitude, which is not on the basis which is the actual number that we are looking for, keep it the same. AI remains AI. But uh, for the axis, the amplitude for which the axis is the number that we are looking for, replace it by minus AI. Put a minus. This is the minus that you will always see in any quantum computation. This very important minus. Now you may ask, how do I know? Well, it's simple. I can, within a linear uh, set of gates, linear in small n, design this oracle. It's no problem. It's an implicit oracle. We also do it classically. Just write down the SAT formula and ask each time. We can write a SAT formula in the order of small n of gates, not of large n. Same here. We use a small n of gates, and we have the oracle. No problem. And then the second step is even weirder. The second step, sorry, the second step tells us, take the average of all the amplitudes and flip each amplitude over the average. Okay, if all amplitudes are the same, a, a, all the amplitudes remain the same. Other, each amplitude which is below average becomes above average and vice versa. Repeat all those steps, and finally, it's a promise, I will show you, that the V that you will observe, now you do a measurement, you collapse the function into one axis, and the axis that you will get is with finite probability, no matter how large is the N, not zero probability, uh, you found the number that you want. F of V of the one you collapsed is one. Magic, right? How is this magic performed? Very simple. Let's repeat all, this all the um, algorithm. We started, this is the initial state. All amplitudes are uniform. This is um, the x-axis, this is the amplitude axis. Okay, i. And this is our special w, which we don't know, which we want to find. First step, oops, sorry. First step, this guy was flipped. This was the first step. Then, keep in mind that the average now is almost here, but a little bit below this line. It's like all of us, you know, or maybe not all of us, those of us lucky enough to have 10 fingers uh, have above average number of fingers. Same here, right? The average is slightly below this line, and this is crucial. Why? Because now I flip over the average, so this goes a little bit, I exaggerated. It went down, but this guy goes up very high, right? And then I iterate the steps. So this one goes down the first step, second flip above the average, and this one now went up um, twice as much, and so on and so on and so on, exactly square root of times and square root of n times 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 square root of n the initial state gives me a finite probability. So this is actually quantum computing. The basics, this minus, this destructive interference, and the example. So I won't talk about the challenges because time is up and you know all the challenges. Actually, our V vector is actually not the logical vector because unfortunately, we cannot build logic out of air. We must have a physical system. So my V vector is actually the V vector of all the world. The, the, the logic is on some physical entity, right? So, so I'm measuring all the physical entities. So how to separate the logic from the actual 
physical implementation. This is the challenge. Actually, this is a mistake. I wrote here challenges. We only have one single challenge, right? <laughs> Separating the logic from the world. Everything else is a side effect of those challenges. Approaches to resolve, so go to very low temperature. We have good, by the way, for physicists, this may seem a high temperature, 15 millikelvin, but keep in mind that this should be sustainable. This should be a working computer. So it's a very low comp uh, temperature for something sustainable, and we have good refrigeration techniques today. Go to very fast computation time. The gate should be implemented very fast, much shorter than the decoherence time, and quantum error correcting methods, which is a huge field and a great and interesting field. Okay? Physical implementations, again, I will not go over it. You, as I assume most of you know, and then uh, on each implementation, each implementation you needed a genius or a set of geniuses uh, to, to, to come up with it, and there are many. Uh, we work with Josephson Junction, which I personally truly believe that the future is there. Uh, D-Wave is interesting to talk about as well, but we won't do it now. Um, unless you want to. <laughs> um, okay, uh, we can speak about those, but we heard, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I was in Paris yesterday, so I missed yesterday's talk, but I assume yesterday also quite a lot of discussion about Joseph's functions. I've heard it today, so, so no, 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 no use for me to tell. Okay, and now we come to IBM Q. Uh, so this is the computer here. And all those guys, all this room is for the computer, serves the computer, all the people serve the computer, all those machinery serve the computer, even they hear a nice window idea. This is the setting, okay? Um, again, it's not just mess, it's actual computer. This is inside the cylinder. Here we see the cylinder. This is the computer. Of course, the refrigerator is down there somewhere. This is all the setting, all the microwave, gigahertz, whatever have you to manipulate the gates, to observe the results, to do the error correction, call, all, all this wiring. Uh, this is a wafer with all the chips. This is a five-bit Josephson Junction um, 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 a chip. Uh, this is a 16-bit. This was announced quite, uh, just probably two weeks ago, I think. Um, uh, this is the one that you are right after this talk go, not after this talk, so after all the talks today, uh, go to your room and just play with it. You can play with it from your room. So for those of you who haven't done it already, for this one you need to apply to get uh, better access, but it's also on the cloud. So those two chips are on the cloud for you to play with. This is how you play with. You put gates, so this is the five. Each line is a bit, okay? And you just take gates with your mouse, Mouse, M-O-U-S-E, not mouth. Um, you, you, take, you, take, you take a gate with your mouse, put it somewhere, put it somewhere. If you are doing something illegal, it will tell you that it is illegal. And you have an algorithm. This is an algorithm. This is the measurement. You tell them to measure. You press run, and it runs on the quantum hardware, on the cloud. Typically, well, the runtime is nothing, is, is, uh, is, is nothing, right, a millisecond. But uh, typically, you would wait maybe a minute or two to get the results. You get notification in mail that you got the results. The minute or two is probably the time it takes to send the mail. But sometimes it is maybe one hour, two hours, maybe even tomorrow morning, because if there is if someone, I don't know, from MIT or some other uh, uh, utilizes all the chips for their experiment, and you wait in line, but typically it's one or two minutes, you get the result, and you can press simulate. So either you run on the real hardware, or you run on the simulate. There is a tutorial which will tell you how to observe the results, how to see, to understand what you get. You get a, for, a, for, each, for each bit, you get a, the, the observed value, and so on and so forth. So of course, it's a probabilistic, you get a probability. Uh, some statistic, 48,000 users, half a million executions so far and growing. Uh, 17 cents, uh, not from IBM, from people who used it already in the few months that it was there and used it to create scientific publications. So you see, quantum computing is good. It's working. It produces results, right? Scientific <laughs> publications are results. It, uh, <laughs> so so um, uh, 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 you see all this. Uh, what else? Okay, nice. This is the SDK, which is growing, is developing, uh, whatever. Uh, so, so just press this link and you can work on it, okay? Um, 
what else? Okay, uh, IBM has some strategy. I mean, it's not just a game. So obviously, IBM builds quantum computers. That's the first part of the strategy. We, we, we build, we want to build, we build. It's our, in our strategy to build quantum computers. We believe that either it will be a total failure, so what? I will fail a few times, but it might be not a failure, and then it is going to be the big thing for the next 70 years. It's going to be a, a significant thing, and not only IBM believes it, probably a lot of you believe it, but also Google, Microsoft, to some extent Amazon. So, so people not believe in it, invest a lot of money in it. So this is part of the strategy. But the less apparent parts is that applications without applications which are going to provide business value quantum computers is nice maybe not even nice maybe oh they are okay but if there will be applications then they are going to be uh, huge they are going so 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 part of the strategy is application and the third part is community and ecosystem ibm does not and cannot do it alone IBM needs all the audience here and all the audience everywhere in order to have a win-win situation where we provide our knowledge, our hardware, our hard work, and you guys participate with us and provide your knowledge, your hard work, and we work together in various forms. The most simple form, go ahead and play with it and provide feedback and run applications and publish papers. And this is how the thing will grow. So this is the three-leg strategy of IBM. Um, okay, roadmap. Uh, I mean, you are so polite with me that you give me to speak as much as I want, but I shouldn't take uh, advantage of this. So, so going now very fast. Um, uh, it's, uh, let's, let's, let's keep this one. Uh, it's, it's more details of the strategy. Um, uh, the 16-bit the, the computer, and uh, let me tell you a secret, not even... Ooh. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, this is not going to work alone, right? Not even if it was 200 bits. So, there is some big challenges here, um, working in a hybrid mode between some serious computer and uh, this is the computer. They should interact. Each one should do what it knows to do. Uh, for example, and uh, I will two minutes or three slides in 30 seconds, this is a molecule, a uh, simple molecule, very simple molecule, 25 electrons I can solve on my laptop, more than 50, no chance, and no chance means not even approximate solution. Such simple molecule, I only want the bond lengths, look at the discrepancies. In our body we have millions of those, this is an important thing. All enzymes are important. It combines three parts, active parts. A small one, a medium one, a large one. This one produces uh, ammonia. Critical for medicine, critical for fertilization, critical for what have you. We have no idea how to model this. Quantum computers, maybe would, maybe would not. Maybe hard in the mathematical sense, maybe hard only in the common sense. We should try if we don't try. We, we would never know. I will skip this one because it's part of my 20 minutes, and this is an interesting slide. Those is the slide of the questions. Many questions we can ask. First, how many bits, right? So we already have 10. We believe we will have 50, not only IBM, everyone. We, we, will reach, we as humanity, will reach 50. 500? Depends if you believe it or not. Maybe there is a fundamental Barrier here, maybe not. If there is not fundamental barrier, then who knows? Moore's law, right? 500, 5,000, 5 billion. And, and then what can we do? If we have, say, 100, 200, 500, okay, we know, we all know, we can, uh, we can uh, do factorization, we can do Grover search, right? Unstructured search in any uh, huge things. But if we have more, maybe chemical emulation, optimization, then you reach, by the way, all the classical, I mean, algorithms is nice, and it's theory, and uh, classical algorithms. But, but uh, Tachles, as you say, computers work on heuristics. They don't work on algorithms. They have in the basic algorithms. But, but to solve a problem, you need heuristics. We are not there yet. We need to design a heuristics for current. Suppose if we reach 500, we would need heuristics. 
And general purpose, of course, uh, if we reach uh, this level, then of course. Uh, but, but this is only one question of how many bits. So many interesting questions for the 70 years to come. Programming languages, are we going to program in C++ and let the compiler translate it to quantum, or are we going to design a new language? In any case, we don't want to be theoretical physicists to run this computer, but the question is whether C++ is okay, or whether we need entirely, I, I don't know, nobody knows. Software stack, firmware, compiler, whatever. Nobody knows what's going to be here. Quantum classical hybrids. We want to write a single problem. Someone needs to separate it into the quantum, into the classical, very, very significant piece of work to do in the years ahead. Design automation, currently design is, you know, done by theoretical physicists, by experimental physicists, and it is done by hand, and it is good, and it is correct, and fine. But this is for 16 bits, maybe 40 bits, 40 bits not. You need automatic tools to do this. If you want this uh, Moore's law, you know, and verification. You need to know that what you did is what you wanted. Uh, each, each balloon here is years of work of dozens of people, not only in IBM, in universities, in Googles, everywhere. Each balloon, huge amount of work. And let me finish by this. I don't know what is going to be in the future, but I know the past and the present. This is the past eight years ago now, wow. And this is the, future, this is the present. Whether eight years from now we are going to be, you know, in the same analogy or not, I don't know. Thank you. And uh, go ahead.